Kia ora koutou and welcome to NZR Around the Grounds from New Zealand Rugby bringing you closer to our national game. Poor mental health is perhaps one of the most significant challenges facing New Zealanders today. It's not uncommon for our friends and whānau to go through tough times and many of us still struggle to talk about these challenges and seek help. Rugby is in every community across New Zealand that can play an active role in making a significant difference to the mental health and well-being of Kiwis. Rugby can be a vehicle to connect with hard-to-reach communities, young people, men, rural communities, Māori and Pacifica. One of the ways NZR does this is through the mental health and well-being program Mindset and Engage. To discuss this program and rugby's opportunity to be a positive mental health tool is a really cool guest today. Genuinely, I mean this, genuinely, one of my favourite All Black midfielders, a man who is connected to every single letter of New Zealand rugby, from the All Blacks to the grassroots. Welcome to the podcast, Peter Alatini. Malo, Peter. Malo, Lele, and oh, what introduction! And I always get this uh, the favourite All Black one. Are you yeah. guys sure? <laughs> Mate, I am. I, you, when you were at your peak of your powers, I was uh, an impressionable teenager, 19, 20 year old, and you were doing your thing. Part of you know perhaps some of the most historical rugby test matches in our time playing alongside Jonah, Cully, you know, playing for the Highlanders, the Canes, mate. So so I loved your style of footy, and, and that's something we'll touch on today. But, yeah, I just want to ask you first up, mate, what's what's going on these days? We saw you, we, you pop up, you know, every now and again, whether it be a bit of um, commentary on professional rugby, whether it be in match fit, you know, there's sometimes, obviously, some of, you know, particularly with NZR Plus, there's be some uh, some archival footage, you know, which, which you feature in, which is cool. Um, to be honest, firstly, you look, about as fit as you did when you were playing for a start. Uh, actually, <laughs> oh, need to thanks. put on. You actually need to put on a couple of kgs, Peter. <laughs> but yeah, what, what's going on today, mate? Oh, look, I'm I'm really uh, fortunate and, and happy to be be on this platform and especially talk about something that I am passionate about. I I, I feel um, it's a big part of me growing up. Uh, one is probably not understanding at the time at a high level what that was yeah. uh, and putting a name to it. And uh, you know there was a stigma behind uh, mental health back in the day, but so uh, good to be part of a group that can normalise this and, and really for the for our generations that are coming through the game, which know that face so much more than, than, than we did at a at the same age and how do we make sure that we look after these kids um, and, and, you know, give them a, a journey that not only one that they can prosper with uh, in terms of maybe financially but also to enjoy it as well. And I think it's been a big part that's been missing with our kids of today. But a normal day for, for myself nowadays, um, well, in the mornings with my match fit buddies of uh, Brad Mika and Charlie, we um, we try and get up early, as, as early as we can to try and win the day, as they say. So yeah. 5.30, we're out there at Body Talk with um, Alex and Phil, and we get a workout in. Maybe more joking around than a workout, some, some, some of the people, some of the members may say, a bit loud at times, but that's just trying to hide the pain. Um, but we have a coffee and a catch-up, and then it's... Um, then I'm off to work to, to the Course Collective where I, I work nowadays, um, and that's a social change organisation, Pacifica led uh, and working in South Auckland. So really looking at complex problems as we uh, do know within our communities, especially in high deprivation areas, um, and, and mental health is, is a huge and wellbeing is, is a big part of that. But understanding the complexities and live realities of our people, understanding then how do we uh, are able to collate that and put forth to the system around things that they have supplied but probably not naturally have hit the needs of the people. So it's a bit of an ongoing process. I thought I knew my community and I grew <laughs> up in Ōtara mm-hmm. back in the day and uh, by my fond memories compared to, I suppose, what people face today in, in today's world is, is a bit different. So it's been a real eye-opener. Um, you win, you really do take the little wins and you, and you kind of build on that to try and um, reach areas where you really want to kind of Create sustainability, I suppose, to to get to get people to live better lives than what they are doing at the moment. Mate, that's awesome. And also, you know, what's got you here today is do a little bit of work for Mindset and Engage as well as a facilitator. Uh, you know, how did you get into that role, and what does that role entail? Look, I was um, rung up by by Nate and actually emailed and and, and asked, and, and I suppose coming off match fit um, and understanding a bit around the, the, the mental health and well-being, and like I said before, I'm, I'm really passionate about it. Why? Because I went through it, and, and I didn't even know. Um, as, a, as a young young player in an All Black, um, and the different challenges I had at that time, um, 
yeah, I just didn't didn't have a very good coping mechanism around it, and um, and so when when the opportunity came to be part of it. Um, I was lucky enough through Nathan and Susie at the time to, to be introduced to the program. Um, and, and part of, I suppose, what they saw with myself coming in to help co-facilitate was that I'm a rugby player and they're going into these clubs and the expertise that Nathan and Susie have got is one thing, which is great. But when you're going into rugby clubs, <laughs> and there we see you know, people who, who are reluctant to change yeah. or, or just, just the unknown factor, but then having someone who's probably, one, has been through it, Two, understands community rugby, but also understands the, the levels and pathways that gets to the top. So I suppose it was a natural fit for me to be part of as long as I suppose understood the co-pop up behind it, um, and, and which which I really loved. And, and the next part was to really, how do we get clubs to create awareness of this, to really be known that if they're faced with kids going through this or their members, what have they got in place to really help these guys through? Fully knowing that they're not professionals, but what... What are steps in, in terms of the club to keeping their players safe in terms of mental health and well-being? Mate, awesome. So Mindset and Engage, it's a website, isn't it, with a whole lot of information, but the part that you're um, passionate about and linked to is the delivery of the workshops. Is that right? So you go into our, is it grassroots rugby clubs and deliver, what, for an hour, two hours, um, and around, what, some tips and tricks to have really positive mental health and well-being within a rugby environment. Is that right? That's right. That's right. But it's really touching base and understanding, um, probably taking the stigma off, uh, mental health and well-being that we used to look at it as, as a black and white thing but now yep. it's it's looked at a in a spectrum where you can go back and forth so th- the big piece around it is just awareness for the for the clubs to know um, what mental health looks like and it could be you know and it's different and then and then kind of some just some key kind of points around when you do um, reach in such levels um, what help is out there the other side is, is understanding the frameworks of well-being that's that's there. So Fadi Tapafa, Te Fadi Tapafa is, is a big part of that framework. Understanding how do you keep all those pillars healthy enough to to build a strong Fadi for yourself, um, and then obviously uh, touch on a bit of Fauna Fale as well. Just another framework for, for in, in terms of Pacifica as well. But really, the the big piece is just the awareness for for all members and clubs. Um, but then understanding that when it does happen, can it, making sure that clubs have something in place so that should someone be going through something that they already have got somewhere to go to that these the members I suppose feel safe within their club is probably the biggest thing especially if they are going through mental health but a little just here's a little awareness pieces that, that get players to you know that sometimes what they may be going through can, can be normal Yeah, you know it might be just a normal part but if it goes longer than this then what is that then and you know whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, then so it's just giving some some key tips around that. And it's around uh, uh, anywhere to between an hour to ninety minutes as a session that we take with clubs, and it's pretty cool because it's clubs all over, and every club is different. Totally. You know, a club in um, Christchurch, like we went to Southbridge down there, and <laughs> yeah. home of Dan Carter. <laughs> happy days. Yeah, oh mate, it's a Dan Carter museum, mate. <laughs> so, which I was just blown away. Like, I was like, oh wow, this is cool. Um, you know, two clubs up in Auckland. Yep. You know, so there's a vast difference, and 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 the cool thing is that um, although we've got a uh, program that's kind of you know we've got a template, but we just make sure when we deliver, it's accordingly to to suit the purpose and, and the community groups that we go to. Mate, I love that because you know sometimes the messages and the things you're trying to put in place are not hugely different whether they're delivered in any type of sports club, even a workplace. But what I love about this program is one that it's delivered within rugby by rugby people. So mm. you go to inter clubs, speak to a language. Um, that they understand, but also, as I said to you before we came onto the mic, it's not always what you say, but who says it. And, you know, um, you know, getting the advocate right is really important, isn't it? And I'm sure when a lot of the participants in the workshops look at someone like yourself, they see someone they know, mm. um, someone that maybe looks like them, someone that speaks in a language that they speak, and someone they know is a part of the rugby community. And I think straight away you're on the front foot when you're delivered in that capacity. I think it's a really good way to deliver positive mental health and wellbeing tools. So good on you, mate, for doing that. What I what I wanted to touch on now a little bit is, like, tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Like, you talked a little bit about growing up on, Ot- on Otara and, and um, you know, perhaps being away from that community and now going back into it and then sort of thinking maybe you knew it inside out, but but also <laughs> you're learning a little bit as well. Like, what did growing up look like for you? Oh, look, I've got awesome fond memories of, of Otara back in the day. Um, you know, what we... What we saw, thought, you know, what people probably saw as trouble from the outside. We just we looked at it in a different way, or, or we knew that person that was in, in trouble. But 
Like, you know, it was a simple times where play was a lot of, you know, play was a huge kind of factor in keeping us um, engaged in something positive more than kind of um, looking elsewhere for it, you know. So so footy, and we had a park that was across the road from our house at one, East Tamaki Road, 148 East Tamaki Road, and <laughs> and you always meet across the, the road of the park. So one year at the Dodge, the car, well, back then there wasn't many cars, but as, as it got... Um, more and more popular. There was the, the, the main road at East Tamaki Road was busy, so you practice your side stepping and being able to dodge <laughs> to get to the other side. And then, and then, and kids would just um, collate to this park and, and throw a ball around, whether it be touch, whether it be um, uh, soccer, whether, it didn't matter. We just played. And, and so, my memories of growing up in South Auckland were always positive. Um, we we you know we got hungry. We go and, and steal fruit from our you know neighbours, and as you're walking past from school, uh, you know. So there was a real you know communities were tight, you know. So everyone knew of each other. Everyone knew to play until a certain time, you know, just before the sun uh, goes down. <laughs> so that's it. Everyone takes off, leave the ball and go because they know you know any later you get it from your parents. So um, so there was a real. Uh, I suppose everyone knew of each other, community, and, and I suppose the safety aspect, regardless of, you know, there were street kids, there were, there were a bit of gangs um, and stuff around, but not probably prevalent to what it is today. So so in terms of upbringing, um, we always had positive. I had, I had a big house. I was, I was um, two years old when I was born in Tonga, and, and I came through when I was two, and pretty much lived in New Zealand um, from then. And so we had, we were the kind of our family house, mum and dad, dad being the oldest um, from Tonga. We kind of h- had the house for all our families to come through, yeah. settle in before they, they moved out. <laughs> so our house was constantly around 16, 17 people. So dad had to get us a garage. That's an intense game of backyard rugby. Oh, isn't mate. It? You know, we had, we, <laughs> and had uncles and aunties and, and their kids and stuff. So it was always busy. So dad um, made a garage, and you know, not for cars. It was for all the boys to be outside <laughs> with cultural uh, aspects within, you know, boys and girls being separated as such in terms of our space. So, but uh, like I said, mate, look, we had a lot of fun. We played a lot of games. We backyard cricket, you, you name it, you know. And um, and it was just a just a real kind of blessing to to kind of have that as a kid growing up, knowing knowing full well. And East Tamaki Rugby Club was our junior club, so wasn't too far well you just had to walk everywhere because you only had one car right so so that that gave us a bit of fitness but yeah a lot um childhood boys I, I couldn't complain mate you you know you you grew up in rugby clubs you know um you know and then also um post your rugby career spent time at, at Pakaranga rugby club being a part of the um being part of the rugby program there um you know and now you're back through mindset and engage going into those clubs doing workshops engaging with people um What's going really well? You know, what are you seeing in terms of going well? Because I think from my experiences quite often, particularly men, but also those types of environments, rugby environments, environments that are often seen as quite stoic, actually, when done properly, they're good environments mm-hmm. and they will engage with good information and they will change behaviour if you really put some time and energy and thought into how to do it properly. What are you seeing out there in our rugby clubs that's going well? Because I, you know, I always think as well, whether it's a, a good rugby coach, a good teacher, um, you know, your father, your brothers, whatever, those people are pretty significant influences in your life. And if you get the good ones in the right place at the right time, then you've got a real chance of making a difference. And that's it, Rob. Like you've hit it on the spot. I think the clubs that are doing really well have that in place. Yep. You know, they've got the, the backbone in, in terms of uh, the afi and the support from members that do really care. And so they look after their volunteers. So they really know how to build a club and build membership and making sure the changes... Um, and really accepting all, so families and yep. um, how do you create that to, to be nice and safe for, for kids growing up um, within the club, um, being really diverse as well. And, and what you have, girls are all, you know yeah. part of the of the programs now. So, you know, my era of growing up was like really separated. You know, yep. boys and boys and, and girls were out, but but it's cool. <laughs> Excuse me. The clubs that have it right have those things in place, and and they really do work hard on how do they get better doing that. And um and, and Pakuranga kind of I saw the change in that, and and really helped by when the women's rugby was here we managed to really um, do up the club I suppose was the final part around our changing rooms to really make it more welcoming um, for women's rugby and and, and, and and diverse communities that that are able to use the facility, 
Um, the, the, on the other on the other coin, and you know, you've got the the struggling clubs, um, and that just comes down to memberships within. Comes down with leadership as well, um, time. Yep. You know, and, and and dare I say it, but you know, my South Auckland clubs besides Monaco who actually won the didn't they? they won, <laughs> won the, um, the the Gala Shield. The rest is struggling, and even to an extent, and, and I think it's more in membership, but also in good help. Just having, um, if you don't get it right, volunteers won't be around. Yeah. You know, we and, and our volunteers, is, it's it's a big job. It's not, you know, it's not a, just a, a quick uh, couple of hours here and there. It's it's a whole day, totally. on a Saturday. But then, in terms of preparation during the week, you know, how much more time do you give? So, I was fortunate enough. I mean, I went to Pakuranga, although my clubs were. East Tamaki and Urhu when I came back from Japan. Part of it was, was a coaching pathway that they kind of had because um, Paul Feeney and oh, yeah. were at um, Pakuranga at the time. And and so, you know, for me to learn under, as hard as it was, because Pakuranga was never really my club. We used to actually call them Orange orange something. <laughs> um, but, you know, because they were always on the top end. Yeah. And plus they were all they were Balangis and all our boys from <laughs> Odahu and stuff were poly. So it was like, who playing Pakuranga? Oh, yes, <laughs> we're playing these guys, Orange Ruffies. <laughs> but, um, you know, the community had changed yep. um, since I'd got back and, and the opportunity was too good to, to not to, to, especially for learning for myself um, post-rugby and, um, you know, coaching was where I thought I wanted to be, but I suppose it was, it was great being a director of rugby because you had so many other branches yeah. and work that made me develop more skills than just the coaching. And, and a lot of it was, which I really enjoy, is the connection piece from junior rugby all the way up to senior rugby to the to the big boys at the back that, you know, will have a dig at you to own the club as such, the what you call like like the mafias of the club, oh, our totally. old our yeah. old boys, you know, he'll oh, tell yeah. you every story you have, but... You know, all they want is time, yep. you know, and, and, and you just got to, you know, bite the bullet. But I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed listening to their stories and, and it got me to to learn more about the history behind Pakuranga, where the things that they kind of come from and, and which made sense to me. Um, and so um, that part of when, when clubs have got there, and I see that, and, and unfortunately the clubs that have like a good board, a good committee, yes. well organised, they have other streams of revenue. It's not really dependent just on funding streams, although that's a big part of it, but they have other forms of revenue that, that they can um, produce through through activities in the club. Those clubs are, are pretty well set and, and are quite, um, when we come in with such programmes, it's, it's quite open. They're quite open because they see the value of it. Yep. We, as you pitch that to others, man, they're only kind of living above water, you know, so they're still thinking, man, how are we going to, pay for these jerseys are yeah, we going to yeah, yeah. you know get people in or, or get more membership within our club to, to get it functioning around different areas so which is a sad part and I think the gap is, is getting bigger and bigger which is really sad and, and even in the two years and a half that I've been away from the game I've tried to go back to Stamaki we've only got um, two senior teams now one is the 21s and then there's the Prezies <laughs> and, and I've come back with the Prezies to help out and I was like oh man a bunch of broken heads Broken uh, fellas trying to play, but we hold that space just to entice to, to get our some of our members back and, and such. We know it's going to be a long process, but part of it are guys that I've grown up with and how do I get back in, in that kind of way to to just uh, entice more. Because I know these heaps yeah. more, but just trying to really get guys to gravitate to the club and see how we can just start building it nicely in our junior group. Really. Mate, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a couple of things to touch on there. Like one, the great thing about Mindset and Engage is that um, if, if someone does ask for a workshop or a program, mm. it comes in, it's free, it's delivered mm. for you. And, and from what I'm told, invariably the feedback from the sessions is really good, no matter what state the club's in. So I think that's a really important message to get out there. And secondly as well, the point you made a little bit around Manukau and other clubs, when you do get some good people involved and you make sure that you acknowledge their contribution, a club can thrive, can't it? You know, and you sort of see that with, with Manukau recently, which is great. Mate, I want to ask you a little bit around a great thing about your role as a facilitator is you've got an absolute plethora of rugby experiences. You know, can you think back to when you were a young fella, a completely different time, maybe some of the challenges you faced, you know, like I know it was probably um, a lot of fond memories, but also there's not perhaps the acknowledgement of mental health issues, um, back then as there is today like can you remember your times there and maybe some of the challenges you faced I think um, without knowing it at school because I was in Otara and I was at Ferguson Intermediate I was one of the first um, to be offered a scholarship at King's College and that was through I call my Balangi parents the Willis's who um, who I played with, the, with their boy who became uh, my best friend 
um, during uh, Auckland East Roller Mills. So I built a relationship and they felt that an opportunity at Kings would be great for myself to, to go and explore. Not really knowing what, what yeah, was going yeah. on at Kings and even trying to explain it to my mum and dad. It was like even yeah. more of a, a mystery. And, That's pretty but, phenomenal though, isn't it? Yeah. Like they saw something in you to, to put your name forward at Kings That's and right. perhaps create a, a different pathway or a new opportunity. It, it's fantastic at that age that they saw something in you, mate. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> I don't know what it was, but um, you know, it, it kind of worked out. But but I think those early years in school, and I, I, it was just tough to, to really navigate because the Pacific, there was very few Pacific Islanders yes. or, or Maori um, within the within the school. But if they were, they were of um, people that uh, had high status. Right? So yep. they were either um, the, from from Tonga. I mean, there's young prince, crown prince, and and his brother there um, from um, Samoa. They were chief sons, and so they were really right. you know they had status and stuff. But got to meet them. They were beautiful. You know, made me feel welcome, and which was cool. But I suppose in, in, in that early part, just navigating myself in the, probably the first three years just to see where I fit within the school. But again, I was lucky enough that I had a headmaster that cared as well. They gave me pastoral support as much as uh, the Willis's. Um, and so I was able to kind of, you know, there was times of doubt because I, I'd, I'd leave um, school and, and kind of go back to Ōtara. <laughs> I was like, oh, back to the real world, you know, um, with 17 people at home. You know, you know, I have to go to school, but I, th- I suppose one time, because um, I used to go to on a bus with, and I've told this story before with De La Salle boys, similar uniforms, okay, so when, when the bus route comes in and stops off at Middlemore, that's where all the De La Salle boys go, but the bus, was, this one's instance, the, the bus driver questioned me, why am I still on the bus? And I said, oh, I actually go up to the school up the road. Well, he didn't believe me, and he was telling me I needed to get out, and I said to him, look, I go to the school, just take me up, yeah, <laughs> and anyway, he... Got got me up to the next bus stop and I got off and then said thank you. But then I went into the bus. He actually stayed there and just looked at me. So, you know, to, to kind of have a yeah. think of it, even your own world, couldn't believe that you were, you know, that you'd go to the school. I might have given him a jest and then ran <laughs> ran into the gates, but yeah, you know, <laughs> gave him a little pistol peat, I suppose, <laughs> and then took off. But, you know, it was really um, in that instance to kind of see there was, you know, divide in status around understanding that but I didn't understand it and and I suppose um, my memories in terms of challenges within school was great once I was first 15 <laughs> everything disappeared because you're just you know you're lifted up to a certain level but um, I think it was the more more the challenges came because I did have a, a baby early yes so, so when I left school I was really kind of navigating that uh, a relationship and then kind of trying to establish a, a career um, I suppose off school, going in the counties, working uh, money for there, but also trying to really break in and, and see where I sit as a as a um, as, as a player. So in that time, it was just you know to play at NPC. It's a lot for a young man, isn't it? That's yeah, a lot and I didn't on. think I, it was never in my plans to play straight out of school. It was yeah. it was just an opportunity um, from Phil Kinsley Jones that that had kind of um, got myself and George Leo Pepe over. As we all played schoolboys with Jonah, um, and so it was his request to, to say, "Look, if you can get these two over, they're trouble. But if you get them over, they, they may be more. Um, they'll give us uh, more good than bad, I suppose. We can handle their bad." So it was a fantastic opportunity that we couldn't put down. But um, to think that, yeah, to straight off the bat, and all of a sudden, you know, I was playing fullback at all places that I didn't play, but to face. Um, Auckland when they had Fitzy and all the greats, and, yeah. you know, and I just left that unit. Never thought I'd wear any other jersey than blue and white. And here I was playing counties the following year. So yeah, so those challenges, I suppose, was just kind of understanding how how to really uh, balance all those things out. And and to be honest, it was still young, and and so you're just going on. I was just going on adrenaline and handling everything. Mate, I can imagine it. Like being a Pacifica boy in a traditional, you know, white mm. environment, I imagine it was extremely challenging. But it sounds like a couple of things. One sport gave you a bit of identity or being a part of a team obviously sounded like a really good thing and also I've heard so many times people say um, while a coach or a headmaster or whoever it may be may not think it they can be so influential Mm. can't they if they just give you a bit of love and a bit of care try and point you in the right direction you're going to get things wrong as a young guy like I did and I'm sure you did (laughs) mate Um, but but actually um, those lessons their words they, they stick with you for a long time don't they Absolutely, absolutely, and he was—he was like—he was fantastic, and, and uh, you know, he um, 
he kept he knew he, he kept telling me, look, rugby is is great, you know, but he kept pushing education yeah. <laughs> on me, and um, and always put some things in place. But it was just I suppose like the the organic Dalanoa that we have. It didn't feel like headmaster student. He really did feel me comfortable, although his voice was really posh and, <laughs> and really high. But but the Dalan, you know, it was really organic. I suppose is what I'm trying to say, and that's probably a key. Key space in, in terms of then with Pasifika Māori um, when we when we think about engagement with our kids, especially um, with mental health, is how do we create create a safe space for these kids to know who they are and and link it back and and, and speak in a language that they understand as well, you know. So so that's they were, they were really cool learnings. Mate, while well, you mentioned any great George La Pepe and Jonah Lomu memories, like um, I'm sure everyone knows jo- Jonah, but um. George La Pepe was a menace as well, wasn't he? Like that guy was made of concrete, and, and you guys were almost chalk and cheese in many ways. <laughs> you had the footwork and the skills, and and you know the pace, and, and George was just route one, wasn't he? Oh mate, look, he'd be one of um, one of the greatest centres that I've ever played at, um, inside. He really, um, you know, I was really gutted that he went to Samoa early. Yeah. I reckon if he held on a l- just a little longer, I think he would have been the successor to uh, Frank Bunce. He yeah. was he was just that good. He People, look, he he just had no fear in him, man. Yeah. There was, there was, I mean, I suppose coming from a dad who was a correctional officer, you wouldn't. But he just, um, he was just tough. Um, but people really, if you watch, I watch those games back when they do replays. If you look at him, he's such a smart player. Mm. He had great skills. He understood the game. He, he communicated well. He was all over it. Um, and, and one of the best, like, he, he, he'd be um, my greatest protector, but then he would also talk up so much rubbish that, like, he'd put you <laughs> off, like, he'd, he'd trying to get 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 an intimidate, you know, the position that I had to go, mate, shush, let's just catch us, or, or let's just get on with our job. And he goes, oh, yeah, sorry, getting, getting over the top. But he was one of, um, yeah, the greatest centres I, I felt um, when I was playing, coming up through schoolboys, and then also the opportunity to play alongside counties and then we managed to um, have a couple more seasons together in Otago before I, before I left. Mm. And how does uh, Peter Alatini and George Lapipi keep Christian Cullen under wraps? Did you keep <laughs> Christian under wraps? Because that guy was a freak, wasn't he? Mate, the, the, the funniest about Christian Cullen was me and George were um, playing Northern Regions back then rather than franchises. You had the regionals, so Northern Regions, um, A's, me and, tri- uh, me and George were we're second five in centre, and we're playing central. And there was this white scrawny kid that was playing <laughs> in the other team with this fluff in his hair. He just looked like a, such an awkward person, just a bogan, just, just like, a, like bogan a bogan and a geek. <laughs> and then George, being George, going, "Oh, look at this guy I'm marking." So he tried to intimidate, talking rubbish. Well, they got a they got a ball. Cully got a uh, this white boy got an early ball. Got on the outside of George, stepped half the team, scored under the post, and then we found out. That that is Christian Cullen, and I said to George, "Don't ever talk rubbish <laughs> against me ever again." So, we've got to always have that funny story about about Cully, but just the outstanding schools oh, of, of of guys of that era, you know him and Jonah, and it was just and yeah. oh, just phenomenal to be amongst that group of, of talent. A beautiful time too when first 15 games and Northern Regions games went on tally so you don't sort of discover these guys until they're running around you and scoring out of the post, eh? That's right. I mean, that's that, that was the cool thing because you always hear of <laughs> yeah. who was coming out of different regions. These urban myths, yeah, these you, legends. But you haven't seen so you know, at every camp you'll be going, oh, that's that's him, that's that guy, that's uh, Jerry Cole, you know, you know, whoever it may be from different, uh, Anton Oliver was one, everyone yeah. was hearing oh, this, yeah. this scary monster from... Had to from take his birth Marlborough. certificate around with him, didn't he, to prove he was <laughs> underage, I think. Seriously, man, he had, he's the only <laughs> one who, like, you can tell he'd been shaving for years. <laughs> but he was just phenomenal and such a beautiful man. But, you know, everyone had heard him up north. Yeah. I was going, watch out for this guy, man. Apparently just ripped guys apart. Yeah. Yeah. So, it was, um, so, yeah, really cool times, like you said. Not having that social media, not having any media, just had to wait and see. And obviously you'd trial against each other, so then you'd know whether you were good enough to, to face up to it or not. 100%. And you absolutely were, mate. I want to talk about a little bit around the ups and downs of professional rugby. Mm. Firstly, let's talk about the ups in the sense that, do you remember being named in the All Blacks? Where were you when you heard your name called out? You know, like, you know, as I said to you, mate, I was, I was doing a bit of research last night. You, you did everything young. Like, everything was done really, really young. The start and the finish, you know? <laughs> like, do you remember when your name was called out? And because 
rugby playing family, four brothers who yeah. you, you often say are all better than you at footy, that you're the one who played for the All Blacks. The old man, mm. you know, a great mentor, someone who, you know, taught the taught you the value of, of fitness, being physically mm. active, get out and, and hit the streets, um, create a bit of a point of difference for you. So do you remember, mate, the you know, when oh. Peter Alatini was was read out, mate? Yeah, mate. Look, it's, it will never I'll never forget it. Although I mean, we were hung as too because <laughs> we just I was with we were the Highlanders ninety nine. Yes. We were over there against the Stormers. Everyone had written us off because we just we lost to the Canes um, in, at uh, Wellington. So we had to catch a flight straight out straight out to uh, Cape Town. And, but it, the, the cool thing about that was we were, there was no noise. Everyone had said the Stormers were going to win and, and what have you. But we went through and had a fantastic, um, absolutely smoked them. We were cracking up. Um, and then um, and the boys party like there was no tomorrow, right? And then on top of that was like, don't forget, a few of you guys have been told that you have to have this phone call because um, the, the naming of the team, was going to happen while we were travelling back to, to New Zealand. So Travelling back for a party at Tony Brown's, <laughs> Highlanders versus the Crusaders, there one of the go. greatest domestic finals ever of all time. I remember, <laughs> mate. Don't you worry about that's that. That's right. I remember. So we, we were oblivious to what was happening back in back in Dunedin. And, 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 but there was, out of our squad, there's 20 of us, I think, that were due for a phone call the next, wow. the next morning. Well, you know, the, we were meant to all meet at 9 o'clock, and I think our manager was the only one who was up at nine and everyone else was still asleep. But um, we all were ready. We, it was like a phone call. So it was a yep. phone call. From uh, All Black manager from or all, coach? From All Black uh, coach, from yep. Hardy. Yep. And it was just one by one. You'd go in, you take a call, and you're either going, that you're in, or you could see you haven't made in New Zealand that year. It was All Blacks or New Zealand A. Yeah. So we had a whole heap of us waiting in a room and you just get told, you're up, you're up. So when when my turn went up, I I just remember like kind of at that time switching on to make sure I'm hearing everything properly. And then it was just John Hart going on, all I remember going on about the season because, you know, they'll talk to you through. And in my head, I was like, oh, just get to the point, buddy, just get <laughs> yeah, to the point. Yeah. And then at the end of it, he goes, oh, congratulations, you're an All Black. And then it was just silent for ages. I said, sorry? <laughs> it's like, you know, repeated it. And I was just so thankful and, and couldn't believe it. You know, I was, couldn't believe it. And then from there, I was straight up to the room, rung dad, and then, you know, spoke to him. And that was a pretty special moment where we were just, when I said it, you know, it was just silence. And then just hear both both of us just crying and, and letting it all out because, of, like I said, that was a dream, you know, a dream that had come true. But for both of us, and I think it was just a reflection on all the hard work that, that we both put in. Um, and in every kind of pathway and support, I think it was it was just kind of being able to, to to be selected and then kind of have a feel a sense that that those that have kind of supported you, you're happy that that you've kind of reached that that milestone. Mate, so good. And it was there were some real highlights there, wasn't there? There were some fantastic test matches. You played with some of the greats um, of of the All Black um, team. But then, of course, like next year's a saw like. Um, you know, you fell out of favour sort of in and around, you know, 23, 24, 25 and, and was off overseas at 25, 26. Like, you know, like it's the journey can take you so high, can't it? And then, you know, how do you handle, you know, the downside of it, you know, because it's so competitive. There's so many good players in the position and I'm sure it, it doesn't take much to go from, you know, being able to start for the All Blacks to being on the outside. Like, what was that like? And I can imagine it would be really difficult. How did you handle it? Yeah, it was it was tough. It was like I didn't um, fathom that it was going to be um, how long it would take me to get over that. And I think that probably the hardest part to take was, I suppose, I'd already had two coaches in the All Blacks. So one was Hardy, and, and I felt like I was selected, but not quite trusted yet. Whether you know, yeah. I don't know whether he felt I was ready or not. But that was the beauty about Hardy was um, when I got selected in two thousand. I received a letter from him of congratulations and, and then we spoke about, you know, he he felt, you know, that he didn't give me the, the opportunity I deserved. So it was, there was real cool kind of chats in there and, and remain to this day. I got so much respect and, and um, offer to, to, to Hardy. And then I think the other special man is, is Wayne Smith and I felt like he was my man, you know. He yeah. really, um, as much as a great coach, he held everyone kind of accountable in a – and his way, like everyone yeah. was different and how he held that and, and he held that with me. And so because I took that on, I felt like, 
man, I was really thriving. And, and, and to be honest, it was the first time when I was in that year in 2001, I felt like this game, I, I've got this game, the test, test rugby arena to me, it wasn't so much fear or failure anymore. It was just, it was just an excitement to now go and test whoever you play against in the black jersey. I'm able now to fulfil that. That's the kind of when when I suppose that's the feeling um, that you want to get as an All Black is, is when you get into that space where you're starting to see things, yeah. you know, because you're kind of you've kind of got it. And and I, I can taste to that because I just. The last few games um, within the 2001 season, I just could feel like I was really comfortable, you know, without yep. being OT. But I'm just like, I was really comfortable to represent. I was really, I, like I felt belonged. You know, I'm, I'm part of this group now that I, I know I can put this jersey to a different level before I leave. So when I when when the next coaching group came and I, and I didn't get selected, a big part of me I just just got taken away from me, and that was confidence, everything. That, that I really worked towards, I felt like was just all taken in one hit. And I just couldn't recover back and and, um, and I didn't know how to handle that. It just like everything just seemed to, to just anything I, I went to, you know, I went to Canes that year and nothing went right. I went to play this, uh, everything just didn't really align anymore. I just, um, and almost the harder I tried, the worse it got. So heaps of, during that time, my, you know, I, I, I was a real big binge drinker. I yep. really, it was the culture I grew up in. I didn't know any better. I used to see, you know, you, the, the, the train hard, play hard, drink hard, you know, I was part of that group. And and so every time I fell into that space, my coping mechanism was like, just go and get obliterated and, and forget around, you know, it's start again, start again, I'll start again one day. Um, another big part was faith. Uh, you know, I, I went into it to you where I just stopped the drinking, thought I'll go hard. But it's such, it's for me, it's other black or white, and it's like extreme mistake. Yeah. All of this, give up drinking and stuff for a year, okay? I'll, I'll be a Christian and I'll follow this for a whole year. And um, and they were, look, in both ends, they were just all learnings and, and trying to find myself and, and how to best cope with all this. But, and it took a while. I, I'm not going to lie, it didn't. Um, all of a sudden, after a couple of years, it finished. And, 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 Effectively, probably what made me leave New Zealand rugby because was I just had no real faith anymore. Uh, one, and probably myself to, to really prove, and yeah. I felt like there was nothing more to prove at the time because my fight was gone, mm. and so probably a new opportunity was was to be um, that I needed to take, and, and that's where Japan came in, um, and, and and for me to leave, and that was like you said at twenty five, but I felt like I suppose within my lifespan playing rugby I f- it felt like a real long time although I was only 25 yeah to, to to stay on fight which is probably a reflection it was probably hard to take now to think that I didn't have that fight you know it was yeah. like where, where else could I probably looked at to to, to have a, a bit of fight to, to get through in a program probably like like yeah. this might have might have helped me to to grab a bit of fight find the balances to to know that it's not extreme you know yeah. to find that it's a a, a continuum or a spectrum that you can go up and down, but I just, I suppose, didn't have didn't have those frameworks, and so it was one or the other, brother, <laughs> zero or hundred or hundred or zero. So. But I think though, you know, to give context to the conversation, you know, you effectively are a product of amateur rugby, mm. amateur rugby days, and came out with a lot of um, all the good and the bad of amateur rugby. You know, the community, the connection, all the good stuff, the influential people in your life, but also it crossed over into professional where there's some money involved, mm. expectations are high when it's your job. Um, but what wasn't there back when you were playing compared to today is there, is not as much support wrapped around the players. You know, like you're a super young guy, you had a child, um, you're trying to play for the All Blacks, you know, going through all those sorts of challenges but didn't necessarily have mm. um, the support. And then I suppose in, in many ways, mindset and engage and other things are a part of trying to provide that support for our wider rugby community. One I want to ask you is because, gosh, we're just glossing over so many things in terms of all the experiences you've had in your life. You know, there's so many other things we could talk about. But now as we sit here as older, wise, mature <laughs> men, <laughs> Peter. I'd like to think so. Yeah, certainly. Um, still making mistakes myself. Yeah, but, um, you know, what have you learned? You know, mm. like what's, you know, we're always learning, we're always growing. But, you know, when you go into the clubs um, and to, to deliver the workshops for Mindset and Engage as a facilitator, you know, what are the learnings you can take with, with you? Like, what are the things that have stuck from all those 
highs and lows, positive, negatives, challenges, you know, like what, what can you take with you into the workshops? I think for me, it's, it's finding that balance. The oh. balance was the key. Like, you know, like I said, we live such extremes, um, lives at times and, and in the journey, you could be at the highs of all highs and then the lows of all lows. So how is it that you find yourself getting yourself back to neutral, getting that balance and just, I suppose, reflective um, practice is probably one of the biggest things that, that I've come to learn, being able to shut that noise, uh, squeeze the noise out. And then I suppose the reflectiveness will bring in gratitude yep. and really think about, man, what have I, what have I got now? that really no one else can have or can't take away from me or what I've been through that no one else can take away. And I think that was one of my things that that really set on me when I was away in a long time. I was never proud of the of of the time I was in All Black or even wow. all my achievements as, as, as even as a young boy, as an eighteen year old to play for count. None of that was was really relevant because I just concentrated on the on the on the negative part that, that happened to me. And that's all I could think about um, in my journey going forward. So any time I, I got up to a certain stage, if, if something triggered me that was negative, I'd just go straight back down. So it was really, um, really finding for me around what is that balance, and that's why that, that fire type of fire is so yeah. such an easy framework. But you know, but but done and when done properly, it can help so much because you're just trying to make sure you 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 you're building all four posts to be at. Um, to be balanced and, and, you know, on the bottom with the fender, I just mean really being kind of grounded every time. And um, and so that's that's what I can take and, and talk into, into um, you know, into the program when I go in. And I, when I, especially when I see young kids, I can see that they're so, you can see they're on their journey, eh? yep. you know, and, and you're just in my mind, it's like, you know, you're going to come through the challenges and disappointments. It's never rosy, but take it uh, for me it's like well, how, how do we find the approach for the kids to say it's okay these bumps but don't give up because our, our kids are growing up in instant gratification instant totally. a world that they snap their yep. fingers and it's right there for them they right? get the dopamine just straight, just straight away. away straight yep. away and when it falls it falls hard yep. and, and, and for most of them they just turn it back and said well I'm not going to try again yep. so it's really finding that part that Hey, you're gonna hit. You're gonna hit some realities of, of life, and 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 you know, and and people that you'll face that, regardless of how good you are, they just got a different perspective of you, and 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 you know, you just gotta. How do you kind of build our young men or young women to understand that that's just the perspective of us? You know, Rushy used to talk to it about him when he was selected and uh, not selected, and his old man was saying, "Hey, that's only one man's perspective yeah. of of who yeah. you are. There's so many other things." So. How do we build that into our kids to try and really put that through? I think that's the challenge. But being real with our kids, and I think for them, it's just the consistency and support. And whatever that looks like, that's kind of design, co-design with them. Because mm. it's, it's not a me coming in and, and telling you what to do, which was our era. It, our kids are today need a kind of dala noa, I'm listening, I'm listening, and then you're kind of just paraphrasing. Okay, so if we put what you're saying in place, you feel like... That, that's an area that will help you cope when, when you come into this and it's just got to be continuous so that's probably the, the, the biggest things for me is really understanding reflective practice um, finding that balance um, and, and, and doing things that make you happy oh uh, totally doing things that make you happy like oh. I, I do like I wake up early in the morning and, and I go to the gym people go what are you doing a part of it is it's not so much well you know you still want to look good but the big part of it is that Man, you, I just I still love going because I love to train, but also it's the laughs, or you know, and I love being in different environments with different people. Um, who weren't professionals, but they're there because they they want to look after themselves, and it just puts you, but just puts everything into perspective of life, you know. And it's and then when I'm with people that make me laugh, that's always good, you know, and in different spaces, you know. So um, I, I'm always looking for that, and my my, my kids are now all 18, 20, and 28. So I'm on the other. I'm on the other end, brother. <laughs> you know, they they make me. You know, yeah. they they give me up and, and listening to their problems, and go in my head. I'm like, don't say it, don't say it, don't tell them what's good, mate. But I learn off them as totally. well because they're they're teaching me of the world they're living in, and so I'm I'm able to adapt accordingly to make sure. Look, if there's anything I want to do as a dad, and you know, and my, I love my mum and dad and everything, and the era I grew up in, all I can do now is 
you know, make sure that I can practice something that looks um, and build a pathway that, that you guys are, are actually designing and, and I just fit in as a support crew. So so that's those are cool things that, that I can really kind of hold tight to me as, as, as I live the other 50 years of my life, I suppose. <laughs> Mate, good on you. Like, um, Firstly, I think it's just so important when, you know, perhaps preconceptions are where people would look at you and think, oh, successful, formal, black, you know, life's all rosy. But when you're brave enough to share your story and show that, you know, you've had challenges as well, um, then I think that's really powerful. I'm a huge advocate that um, sport and rugby can be one of the best mental health tools that exists, you know, like and, and the communities and the connection that come um, inside those those environments is, is really, really important. So I think um, good on you for the work that you do um, in the Cause Collective and with Mindset and Engage. Um, you know, anyone who wants to find out a little bit more about the program, you know, go to Mindset Engage website and also um, any club that might be listening. You know, as we said before, um, I know yourself and others are happy to come into any club, any environment that is, um, you know, wants to learn a little bit more about this, wants to look after their people. Um, so do reach out um, through the contacts on the site. Good on you today, mate. Appreciate it. Looking forward to uh, watching you, you know, put the boots on for the next uh, <laughs> under-85 game. Maybe I'll go, go against you, you know, and, like, have a crack. But, no, nah, thanks for coming in, man. I know you're a busy man. Top top stuff. Oh, absolute pleasure. And always honoured, mate, to, to really talk around uh, mental health for people and well-being. And it's a huge part of, of, our, um, of anyone in our game that's um, that's going through in all our clubs. Please do reach out. It's such a great program. We're in this piece, but it's cool to connect and, and know that there's some, something really positive um, that's been produced by our New Zealand Rugby Union and, and all our partners. So it's so cool. Awesome. My life.